Right, so as the title says, this is a prototype of a 3D platformer in hyperbolic geometry. So it's third person. This red cylinder here is meant to be the player model. You can't quite tell it's a cylinder though, because there's absolutely no shading yet. Or I'll get back on that yet. Sorry, that was a bit of a slip. But anyways, we can move around and jump and there is gravity. I'll talk more on that later, but essentially here, gravity is just defined in reference to a particular plane, which is the plane of the ground here, and the distance from that plane is the potential field so that you get pulled towards the ground plane, or you get pulled away from it if it's, um, if you're below the ground plane, which I won't show here, but basically the upshot is that gravity pulls you along perpendiculars to this ground plane. Now, this world is made up of these like, tiles, which I'll show you here, and I'll get up so, you, so I can show you. In fact, I've added a sort of jetpack to the player, just to make demonstrating easier. And you can see that these tiles are heptagons. They're irregular, in fact, and they're all congruent. They're identical to each other, though that's not easy to tell with the perspective distortion. But anyways, these heptagons are actually um, the intersections of this ground plane with the chunk grid of the world. So the world is divided into chunks, and those chunks get loaded and unloaded as we move around. And we do that because the world is in fact of a fairly substantial size, and that's what I'll demonstrate next. So if I land again, I'm going to take this particular path to the edge of the world gonna take a bit of time for us to get there. Not that long though. Going and going and going. There we go. So here we're at the edge of the world. Um, and if I walk over the edge, I just hover in place. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have like proper collision. I've essentially just hard-coded that this particular plane is where we collide. It's where we land. So we aren't checking against any of the geometry that we're rendering. Um, or, I don't know why I say we, it's just me, I've done this all by myself. Um, anyways, let's walk to the other edge of the world, and I know which way is sort of a diameter line rather than just a chord, so I'll go along that way, and I'll count how many tiles we cross to give you an idea of how big this world is. So, one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So, this is 14 tiles across this world, and what it actually is, is that we take the center of each tile, and we put a tile there, if and only if, there's, if it's within a certain radius of the origin, so this world kind of traces out a circle. So it's a circle 14 tiles in diameter. In fact, it's about 20 curvature units in total. So, um, yeah, so this, so this particular edge of the, of the tile, to give a sense of scale, that edge that I just walked along is natural log of four curvature units. That's about 1.4 curvature units. And so, yeah, it's 20 curvature units across. And in that circle, there's about 37,000 of these tiles, just a little bit less than that. So if I translate that to everyday units, well, there's nothing here to give much of a sense of scale, but in my head, I decided that this player model, this player cylinder is two meters tall and one meter wide, and that the curvature scale is 10 meters. So these tiles are about 14 meters across, the world is 200 meters in diameter, and just under, like, or just about four square kilometers in area. Yeah, that's, yeah, don't know what more to say, that, I mean, that is the scale of the world, and um, I'll just head back to the center now, and I'll have to count in my head. So you're nearly there. Um, oh yes, yeah, so what I wanted to discuss now that I'm here at the center and we can see the entire world more clearly, or it looks more full, is if I get up high, um, 
or actually first I should start at a known point, so here. Pay attention to how long it takes for me to walk from here to here. And I'll do that again. Yep. And then I'll get up. And I'll try to make that trip across while I'm in the air. You can see it takes quite a bit longer. Um, if I go even higher, it's going to be hard to tell what's going on because of how much is obstructed by the player model. But I think looking straight down is the best way to go about this. If I then cover that distance again, you can see it takes even longer. So you can see here that this is full 3D hyperbolic geometry. It's not two dimensions and then a vertical that's Euclidean. And the way we can tell that is that these verticals that we can draw from here, they diverge from each other vertically. So that mean, that's why the distance is longer. Um, yeah, so what that means, since this is full three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry, is that there'd be a vertical hull on me to worry about. But if I go on the side and I jump and move, you can see that the player stays vertical. So what I'm actually doing is I'm correcting for the for the vertical holonomy. So on every tick that the player moves horizontally, I didn't really mean to hit the control stick there, but I guess that's a useful demonstration. On every tick, on every such tick, the direction of gravity is checked, it's calculated, and the player model is rotated to be aligned with it. That doesn't happen if the player is not moving at all or is only moving vertically like I'm demonstrating here because then there's no vertical holonomy to worry about. But yeah, so the player is being continuously rotated whenever they're moving around horizontally. And um, what that actually ends up doing is I'm storing the velocity of the player like in the player's own frame as vertical and horizontal components. So the player's velocity is getting rotated as well, which is unphysical. It's not accurate to what it would actually be like to have gravity in this world. So if I get up really high, what I can demonstrate is now the angular diameter of the plane below is very small. And you can just slightly see some chunks fading in and out of the render distance. But that's a separate note. Now, what would actually happen if I fell from this height and I kept holding forward is that I'd actually be able to miss the ground and enter something analogous to a stable orbit, except that the thing you're orbiting is flat and infinite in size, which is a bit weird to think about. But that doesn't happen here, which I'll start holding forward now, and I'll stop hovering and let go of A, or that's the button I use for jumping and jetpacking, and you can see we do hit the ground. So that's technically incorrect, but I think it's actually better for gameplay, because the alternative is that once the player finds a high place to launch themselves off of, um, they basically can fly around the entire world however they like. Obviously this jetpack is not going to be provided to the player. Now when I say like the future tense, what the player is going to be able to do or not be able to do, I'm hinting at something, and that is that I will, I do intend to make a full game out of this. So this is kind of the second part of this video, and it's going to get more rambly, just discussing my plans for the future. Um, I do want the full game to basically take place in a single contiguous world that is about the size of this world. As I said, about four square kilometers in total, 200 meters in diameter. Um, and my idea is that basically, aside from platforming, there'd also be a fair bit of exploration. So the it's easiest to explain the, to explain this by an analogy to the game VVV VVV, the letter V six times. In that game, you there's a single contiguous world, but there are sort of levels within it, and it's up to you to, to like find these levels in order to complete them, and to and to aid you in that, there's a set of landmarks, these teleporters that you're trying to find on the map. Um, so that's sort of the idea here, is that there would be levels but placed inside of a single contiguous world, and in analogy to the teleporters, there will be things that help you navigate around the world once you've reached them. And those, my idea for those is to be um, like sp things that shoot like laser beams or some magical equivalent thereof 
to each other. So they make sort of a graph or a network. And the idea with that is because the world is so small in diameter, you don't really need fast travel or teleportation. Instead, it's instead fast travel can really be just knowing what the shortest path is from one place to another. So, so that's kind of like the world would simultaneously be large in area, but small in diameter. And as you complete more and more of these beams, sorry, I'm not moving around because I'm too busy talking. Um, as you complete these beams, you'll the world will sort of seem to shrink because you'll be able to get around more efficiently. I'll start walking around along these vertices, along these lines, just to do something. <laughs> Um, I didn't put much production effort into this video, as you can tell. Anyways, so I'm also toying with the idea of there being a story where the where there are people that inhabit this world and they use these beams as a sort of transport infrastructure. But one day, and this is when the events of the game start, it, one day they stopped working somehow, and you, the player, are their fantasy equivalent of a technician who can fix them. So you have to go around fixing them. That might push suspension of disbelief a bit too far though, because if all the locations that they're trying to point between are less than 200 meters apart, why wouldn't you just lay down some rope or some other physical marker? Why these beams that can fail? Um, I don't know, I'll, f I'll see how that pans out. Um, the other idea I have for gameplay is, is I want to kind of try something which I haven't seen in 3D platformers before, though I haven't played very many 3D platformers to, to be honest. Pretty much just Super Mario 64 and Super Mario 3D Land, the latter of which is on the 3DS. Um, so, what I, so the thing I haven't seen before in 3D platformers is sort of precision platforming of the kind that you'd often find in 2D platformers, like Celeste is a really good example of this. A lot of the gameplay is just trying to, is just kind of repetitively grinding against a particular obstacle until you've honed down the right sequence of moves to get past it. And that's something I actually enjoy, which makes me weird, I know. And that's not something you do, you see in Super Mario 64 at least. Largely, I think the 3D perspective prohibits it, because you can't, you don't get necessarily the full information about the scene like you do in 2D if you're on a 2D screen. So that's something I want to try in 3D. And I think I want to, so one idea I have, for example, is that if I, is that if the player is obscured by something like this, then maybe we could have, then maybe we could sort of cut out a bit of the level geometry in order to make it transparent or outright invisible in order to reveal the player beneath it. Um, so that would make camera management less of an intrusive task if you can just let the camera go behind walls. That would simplify it somewhat. Um, I guess another thing is to try to just make more things that give depth cues, like there's drop shadows, maybe, I don't know, some way there'd be more shadows than just that. But again, maybe just making the camera controls intuitive and nice, which they aren't right now. Um, yeah, so this prototype right here has taken me about half a year to make. I have full Git history, and I can see that I started on the 22nd of June last year. 2023, that is, for anyone watching well into the future. Last year's 2023. Um, that is very... That was very infrequent, sporadic progress, though. Future editing me, please put the GitHub contributions graph on screen. And that's just because I don't have very much free time. But nonetheless, that's the pace I can reasonably expect development to continue for going forward. Um, so I'm thinking if I am to post some kind of update, maybe I'd want to do it at the end of this year or early next year. So a year from now, maybe a year is a good time to let things develop. Um, yeah, but as for the scope of this game, so... I've been making comparisons to Super Mario 64, and indeed this four square kilometers is kind of the area of all of the 15 main courses in Super Mario 64 put together. So, um, so I guess in terms of the scope, it's how long would it take, or can a person reasonably complete 
on their own, in their spare time, a game on the scale of Super Mario 64, which um, is a bit of an ask. But if, if nothing else, it would take a lot of persistence and a lot of time. Like, I fully anticipate that this might take me 10 years to do if I finish it. And because of that, there's a high chance that I'll abandon it at some point. And if I do, I'll try to, like, release my code and such and my assets to, so that anyone who wants to can continue what I'm doing or kind of make their own thing based on it. So, yeah, I'm not keen to release any of my work just yet, just only when there's a full thing being worked on or once, I've, once I'm fully done. So yeah, I guess that's about it.